uh, Dr. Susanna, when I heard your lecture, it was about uh, a month ago when I got it, I was quite excited and I saw it at that time itself. There was still a lot of stuff that I learned from your lecture. So I'm oh, very glad you. and I'm looking forward to this today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Runit? Yeah, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, this is Dr. Runit Nangalia. I am from Kolkata. I am a general dentist with an interest in orofacial pain and dental sleep medicine. So uh, I'm looking forward to the session today. I know Dr. Priyam. Yeah. Okay. It's so, a small world here. <laughs> yeah. Dental sleep medicine must be even smaller. Yeah. So. Uh, I sorry, I missed a bit of PM. So are you are practicing in any particular uh, pediatric or adult? No, no, so I am a general dentist. In fact, I did my fellowship in uh, endodontics, con uh, contemporary endodontics, and then I got into sleep medicine. And then since then, I find uh, this branch so much more interesting that regular dentistry has now become a drag for me. <laughs> no, but I have to do that. You know, still there is not enough and awareness about uh, dental sleep medicine here. Uh, I do have some, uh, I do do these uh, lectures or, you know, just webinars and stuff like that in my community. Creating awareness. Yeah, to create awareness. But uh, yeah, that, that's about it. Um, we have a few more people and then I think we will, I will just start. Uh, anybody else wants to turn on their audio videos? Amrita, you want to say a few words? Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Dr. Susanna, I said you could. Hi, hi, Dr. Susanna. Hi. Nice to see you. So I just joined in, but let me introduce myself. I am a pediatric dentist by this thing. So by pro my my by my studies, but then I do see a lot of adults. So I got into seeing more of adults in sleep medicine. And now I'm, since I've started, you know, I've deviated into this field. Now I've started seeing a lot of children and I've started diagnosing them with their breathing disorders. And of course, you know, started doing myotherapy and all those things for them, you know. So, so I actually started with adult sleep medicine and now... I'm applying it to my children, which we never used to do earlier, you know. So that's how I'm into this field. Okay, so I think I will um, pause now and, you know, let, let people join in. I'm going to just start the session. Um, so just want to introduce uh, Dr. Susanna Falado Ramos to all of you. Uh, some of you, of course, have heard the lecture. Some... I also invited a few people, Dr. Susanna, the people who have just been, so that at least they'll get to uh, know something from the interactive session who may not have enrolled in the course as such or, the, or your talk. Uh, so she is a PhD in pediatrics author and dentistry, so um, has a very solid background. And then she, like she said, digressed into the field of sleep medicine, has been uh, trained and approved by the European, European Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine and the American Academy of Central Dental Sleep Medicine. And she's the vice president currently of the European Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. And she's also received considerable training for this myofunctional therapy, which is uh, the topic of interest today. Uh, she has a lot of other um, ideas, thoughts, and has been kind enough to also propose some master classes uh, which we will send you maybe a small questionnaire to get feedback from you all uh, but she's willing to give her time to go forward in that for this uh, so before we and I would just like people if they can put themselves on mute initially um, and uh, what we can do is either have somebody raise their hand or write in the chat box if they want to ask the question otherwise it starts echoing so we can start by some questions if you anybody has a question ready, but otherwise I have made a list of questions uh, which I can start with if uh, people are still thinking about. So if, if anybody has a question you want to write or you can unmute yourself and just, it's a, raw, a casual thing, so I'm not insisting on too much. Anybody has any question to ask the people who've taken the uh, module? 
Um, can I ask a question? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, Dr. Susanna, uh, I have seen a few patients where um, where I'm not, especially kids, I'm not able to explain to them how to, uh, you know, about the um, um, exercises, posture, uh, you know, the the um, lifting your tongue, uh, the functional uh, assessment. Yes. So I'm not able to fully uh, explain to the kids, especially when I need to ask them regarding how well their functional uh, you know, um, uh, uh, part of the, the tongue, the posterior part of the tongue is, whether it is tongue-tied or not, I need to understand that. And I'm not able to uh, explain to them to kind of assess that. So I'd like you to, uh, you know, um, talk about that. Give me some tips or, you know, about how I could uh, speak to the patients, how I could check that, you know, do the function assessment of the tongue movement. Okay. Yeah. So... The, the first thing I do on my um, evaluation and when I'm doing the intraoral observation, I always ask to the patient to open the mouth. Mm -hmm. And I took immediately a picture. So I can, after, when I'm constructing my uh, clinical history, I can evaluate better how is the uh, tongue position in the mouth and how is the tongue related to the occlusal plan, to the palate, to the hard palate, and to the soft palate. And by doing that, if I ask the patient to open the mouth and um, I'm, I'm evaluating the malampati scale, right? But if I ask the patient, sometimes they, do, they, they stay a little bit confused. And when I ask them to open the mouth, they put the, the tip tongue outside. Don't do anything, just take the picture. And by doing that, you have to evaluate the Friedman scale, but you evaluate the, as the same as the malampati. You have to look um, the, the posterior position of the tongue, the contact with the hard palate and to the soft palate. And again, to see how is the tongue um, level by the occlusal plant. So the normal position, I'm going to do it. I'm going to show it. Okay, I'm trying to show it. It's so hard to do these things online, but I'm going to try to show. So when you open the mouse, the normal position, it will be more or less like this. Okay. If they do uh, this, it's not correct. And sometimes the tongue, it's in crouch uh, posterior. So it's not either correct. Okay, but people stay a little bit nervous when you ask things. If you ask, for instance, can you move to the right? They move to the left. Can you move to the left? So just be normal. That please open the mouth. So as soon as they open the mouth, I take the picture. And after I do the evaluation. And then with the picture, you can show parents or you can show the adult uh, how is the position of the tongue and why you must... Um, do the myofunctional therapy and why you must work the tonos, the muscle tonos of the tongue. Okay, so and th this is simple um, tips. Okay, it's, okay, I hope that I had answer to your question with this. Yeah, I, I was uh, specifically asking about the, uh, the the suction hold. You know, when you make them do that exercise, initially they are not able to understand what I'm trying to say. I mean, I've just tried it with a few patients because I'm not actively doing my functional therapy yet. Okay. When you do the section or when you do like this and they put the tongue between the, the arch. Okay. So if they have this a typical uh, movement, it, uh, it means that when they are doing the swallow, uh, the tongue is not positioned very well in the mouth. So... Uh, it means that the posterior part of the tongue is in contact with the soft palate. Okay. And if it is like that, it has no tonos. And if it has no tonos, when they are asleep, the, the tongue yeah. will fall, fall back and will obstruct totally the upper airway. So they need to work that. Okay. And you, you, you have many exercises like uh, using the straw, doing noses with the straw and a little bit of liquid in the glass 
or uh, doing the windmills, you can also do that, or the soup balloons, um, or, uh, or if you don't have that, just training to give kids. Like, okay. So you, you, and to do this, you are working as well, working as well the orbicular and the tank, because when you do the tank, the, the tip of the tank, it has to be uh, exactly uh, on the posterior of the incisors on the papilla. So or you can teach him as well to put the tip of the tongue in the wrinkles of the heart palate. Okay. Yeah, so somebody else has asked this question. Um, and that's the question I also had. How long yeah. does it take to see the benefits? And what is the minimum period that the patient should continue? It's like going to the gym, right? So, yeah. no, it's very you, slow. It's very slow. What I used to do, I have some children and some adults only on my functional therapy, and I have to explain them very well that they have to do every day the exercise three times per day, and after six months we will do the reevaluation with a new polysomnography, either is a type one or a type two or a type three. What I, what I do before sending them to the lab, to the sleep that lab is um, uh, to evaluate the oximeter, uh, the nocturnal oximetry. I use the, the night oval or the wrist ox or the watch pad. Just I can be a little bit more sure about the gain I had on the, um, on the saturation of oxygen, but no less than six months six for months. sure. And uh, how much time on each? So it's three times a day, but yes, each, uh... three times a day for children. Um, they don't have as much. Um, they, they don't. They don't. Uh, they don't understand why they have to do that. So for children, sometimes it's better than do things uh, uh, on adults. Sometimes it's not. If you you have a small children, you have to give them funny exercise, and uh, you have to change the exercise every day. So you you can work the same muscles, but with different exercise. And you have to change it every day. You have to do it the, the three times, like 10 minutes mm -hmm. each time, no more than that, because they will do, they, they don't have uh, the ability to be focused so many minutes. And if it is an adult, you can ask an adult like 50 to 20 minutes. And, but I always ask how many times by day they have free to do these things or, um, what they do for work, if they do, now there's a lot of people working in the house. So if they are in the computer or they can take like 15 minutes, like a coffee break and they can do uh, the exercise in the coffee break and then continue to work. It's easier on adults. Um, and so I change on adults, I change the type of the exercise each week. So I maintain every single week the same exercise and then I change because doing the same exercise, they will give up. So you have to change the exercise, although you can work the same muscles, but change the exercise. I, so that's just a question. So do you have like a team who, uh, so the patients come in every week or how do you communicate to them that you're going to change it? And how do you? Um, I have on my team a speech therapist. So I always plan the exercise that I want, that I want uh, uh, she, she uh, controls the patient and I always elaborate the plan with her. And for children, um, we always ask the parents how is the possibility of payment because you know it's so hard sometimes for parents to pay two, two appointments per week or one appointment per week. So what we do uh, because of the COVID and because of the pandemic situation, we do the, the, um, the appointments online. And when we have to change the plans, we do the presential appointments. And, and according to the financial possibilities of the families, we can do that each week 
or each two weeks. Okay. And we change the plan between that. Oh, interesting. Uh, somebody wanted to know that is this uh, or is it effective only for the tongue? Or what about the pharyngeal wall and the pillars, etc.? Now, it's not only for the tongue, it's all also for the nose, it's also for mastication and for the slow, slow and, uh, and for also for the pharynx muscles. So there's a lot of exercise as well for the pharynx muscles. And the exercises are very fun, are the ones that I show on the one slide that you have to sing. Um, and you have to, you have to find the words in, in English or in your language, because in Portuguese we have vogels, and in English the vogels does not exist with the same tone. So you have to look for your language, which are the the, the words that are uh, the most used to do and to sing, like the, the, one, the words that opera singers use are the best, the best ones to work all the muscles that open the array and contracts and open the lateral pharynx. So would it, it's interesting. So do no opera singers don't get OSA? It's very interesting. Sorry? I said, then would it be true that the people who are the opera singers do not get OSA? I, I don't know that. <laughs> Is there any study about that? I don't know. But they, 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 when they sing it, when they do that, you know, yeah, they open the mouth yeah, and a lot. All, sometimes you have the idea that you can look in the stomach when they open the mouth, they open so, so well. So, um, yeah, you have to, but the best, the best exercise to work the, um, the, the muscles that open the pharynx are the ones that they practice on uh, the singers. So you have to look for that. Okay. Uh, anybody else has any questions? Otherwise, then I have some list that I wrote down. So do you want to tell us a little, this questions are answered. Um, Can I ask one? Yeah, sure. Uh, how, how do you do myo or exercises? How do you explain exercises to kids who are say about two years, two and a half year old who can't comprehend the different exercises that we use? Two years old child? <laughs> it's too young. It's what, do you, what do you do for two years? It's a challenge. It's a yes. challenge. You, you don't have any... Uh, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> what you do, what we do in my clinic, it's uh, let's have some, um, let's play a little bit. So we are don't, we are not doing my functional therapy. We are going to play with the children. That's what we use to, to we explain to the parents, of course, the what we are doing and why we are doing, but. With the children, what we say, we, we say to them is that let's play and we have 10 minutes to play, okay? So yeah. let's do as many as exercise that, I, that we can. So in 10 minutes, you have to do like, uh, I don't know, um, blow the yeah. windmill or uh, play with the straw. Yeah. So it's like, it's like uh, yeah. running. Uh, it's a play. You have to say that. So we have five minutes to play with me. So let's do as many as I can or when as many as you can. So it's like, like that. And you have like 10, 15 minutes at the most because with two years, it's so difficult to, to do that. So do you get people together in a group session and teach them or is it like individual? No, it's individual. It's individual. Uh, what we do in the clinic is that uh, during the afternoon, we have uh, with the speech therapist, we have appointments with 30 minutes of duration. So she can review all the exercise with the kids and then with the parents, or if it is an adult, she can re re do the exercise again, change the exercise, but no more than 30 minutes. We try not to, to give them more than that. Ma'am, I put my question in the chat box. Uh, is it Dr. Sneha? Yeah, so Sneha, this is actually like a general question. Um, and we have, she's asking about, uh, does OSA affect the overall health and indirectly the ability of sports performance? Yes, um, we have lots and lots of articles and research based on this yeah. that it affects their performance. 
their uh, ability to concentrate, their decision making. So OSA does have an impact on a lot of those things. I mean, and that's uh, definite health related sleep apnea. Yeah. Question. Yeah. If I have to choose um, the proper uh, exercise modality for oral breather, I might choose swimming. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you all know, but that uh, American uh, swimmer, yeah, uh, Michael, Phelps. Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps. Phelps. Yes. Yeah. He was he was a, a, a mouse breather when he was a child, and I think he has also uh, hyperactivity and uh, attention deficit syndrome. So the parents choose swimming for him. So oh, that I didn't know. I, the I, results are there. <laughs> All of them have said, I mean, like from tennis yeah. players to football players to, you yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. they yeah. have talked about their impact. Um, so I just wanted to ask about this term um, for the people who did really attend the lecture, something about. Can you please, people, can people keep themselves on mute, uh, you know, because unless you are asking or write in the chat box, it's resounding. Do you want to say a few words about this ankyloglossia? I thought it was an interesting. Uh, the measurement oh, the, the measurement yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that uh, uh, if the frenum it's uh, short or uh, if it is longer it is not so a, a, such a great problem but when it's short um, it has a negative impact on speech and also on uh, chewing and also on swelling uh, and by doing that the tongue does not have this normal posture that we want on the oral cavity. Uh, and uh, also it has a negative, the development of the dental arch and the, on the occlusion. So um, for the overall of the muscle tone, you have always to check the frenulum, the lingual frenum, and also the upper and the lower uh, frenum as well. So um, I always check that. Okay. Uh, so this is some other. Uh, so somebody is asking, how can we evaluate um, besides doing a sleep study that the patient is doing good exercises? Oh. Uh, you, you really can't because it is a subjective evaluation. Like you do the upward scale or stop bank scale, it's a subjective evaluation. What you have to do to the patients is that if, if uh, he or she or the child does not accomplish the exercise, uh, it's not your fault. It's not you that has the disease. I always say that, you know, I don't have OZA, so I don't need to do the exercise. So if you don't do it, you don't have the results. So uh, in, unfortunately, there is not yet uh, a way to um, object, objectively evaluate the, the, the tone and the exercise. It's always subjective. Yeah, I, I... touch the food. And we need to uh, also eat when we are young and when we are babies, and we need to eat with the hands so we can touch the texture of the food, so we can develop all the textures in the mouth. Oh. So uh, it's um, usual on my appointments when I'm doing, and when I'm doing the uh, intraoral observation, uh, kids are so sensitive to the mirror and to my fingers that they uh, always have that sensation that they are going vomit, you know? Um, and you, you have to work that. You have to work that. And, and sometimes the majority of the kids that has that are oral breeders. Okay. Interesting. So I think uh, the age old thing of letting the children yeah. you know, play with things and feed themselves. To what age do you think one should, what they start kind of allowing them to feed themselves? Oh, I assume, assume that uh, they, they can touch, I think they can grab things, they can touch the food and, uh, you know, by two, three years, uh, yes, it's normal, it's normal, you, you uh, start learning how to use the fork and the knife and the spoon. But before that, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a part of our development as human beings, uh, yes, yes. As, as animals by, you know, 
uh, we, we need to touch things. We need to feel the, the, the texture of things. So I saw in your lecture, you had a lot of the last few slides were on tools for the myofunctional therapy. Yeah. Are these developed by you or are they available or how do you kind of collect them together? They just put yeah, together? I'm, yeah, usually I go to supermarkets. I go to uh, toy stories, uh, uh, stores, sorry, toy stores. Uh, and I like to go and see and try to buy them. Uh, you, uh, I don't know, so, I, I usually don't buy them in the internet uh, unless the store has an online um, shop, uh, shop that, where I can buy it. But I, I like to see them and I like to touch them and I like to try. So uh, here in Portugal, I have a store where I used to go um and uh, they always ad advise me when they receive new tools and i go there and try and uh we have a kind of sponsorship so but uh you can uh, you can use a lot of things you can you can use a uh, toothbrush for for babies it's very good to work the the texture of the food and it's very good to do the massage on the tank so uh, like Runit was uh, asking before, so if you do that with a, a baby toothbrush, you can work the texture of the, the food uh, uh, and it is good for the myofunctional therapy as well. Uh, if you do, uh, for instance, the dental floss, the ones that has the, the applicator, you know, uh, it's also good to work um, uh, the volume of the tongue. And by doing that, you, if you do the massage from the posterior part to the anterior part, you are working the position of the tongue in the mouth. So I'm always looking for something that it's um, easy for parents to buy and it is not expensive for them. Uh, so I also want to ask, so when uh, do you think that there is a when you see a child or an adult, do you think there's a typical kind of a patient in your mind you have that who will definitely do well only with uh, myofunctional therapy? Or when do you think somebody needs uh, a CPAP plus MFT or surgery plus MFT? In your clinical practice, are you able to discern that which kind of a patient you would choose for any of these? Combination uh, I, I, uh, it's, it's not difficult to answer is that uh, I'm working in the multidisciplinary sleep team. So I'm the only dentist in the, in the team. So we have beside me, we have the speech therapist, but we have an internal medicine doctor. And we also have an ENT and a pediatrician and a, a psychiatrist. So all the, um, and the you know, pneumologist. So all the patients, uh, that achieve to our appointment, they are studied together. So when we presenting the plan, we presenting um, not all of us, of course, because they are, otherwise the patient will be scared with so many people in, in the room maybe. But uh, we try to, to, to present the case uh, alone or with uh, other colleagues. So, um, and we present uh, always the case on a combined therapy because uh, people want uh, direct and short answers to the problem. So we don't want to lose the patient. So it, it's, that's why it's very difficult to answer. It's not a yes or no answer <laughs> to your so, question. No, but basically in short, what I'm saying is that um, many instances, there is a combined approach. Would you say that's right? So some that. of your patients are also using CPAP yeah, yeah. and they are using this as an additional tool. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and some maybe would need some surgery, some nasal surgery or something or, uh, maybe, or, or, yeah. or some dental work. And then they would also get the MFT. 
Yes, and we have some that started with CPAP and myofunctional therapy because they needed, because they were very severe cases or, or moderate cases, but with uh, very high signs and symptoms. Um, and they start, for instance, to lose weight, uh, go to the ENT to do surgery and to, to correct the nose. And then they start stabilize the, the, the index and now they are with a, a device yeah. with a mandibular advanced device. So it's a process. It's yeah, sure. So I just want to just say, uh, what is the longest follow-up that you've had for somebody who has been on regular with the MFG and stuff? Oh, we, we have patients for six, seven years in follow-up. Oh. Uh, somebody's saying uh, for children more than eight years where there is a narrow palate but not ready for the palatal expansion would this help not ready for the palate the palatal what? expansion so it's the child is more than eight years has yeah, a but, narrow palate but is not yes. ready to get the palatal expansion done uh you know, with a with a with that kind of problem, the expan the expansion of the maxillary is the the first line of intervention. I don't, I can understand why they are not ready with the eight years, but yes, you can you can start always with myofunctional therapy. We can you can start uh, for sure that child is a mouse breather, so he does know does not know that the nose exists. And has a function. So you, uh, if you start with the the, the breathing uh, by the nose exercise, uh, yes, it it will it will help for sure. Yeah. Uh, anybody else has any uh, other questions from Dr. Susanna? So, I think people uh, so. Uh, have got the gist of it but what I to summarize what I would say is that yes it's like part of a multidisciplinary approach and you talked about the the palm you know the criteria for evaluation and you know which is for the for the pathophysiology it helps a lot um, I just have of course these few things like for everything else that we do to get a good result uh, we need to be very thorough, which what, what I can gather is the exercise plan, changing the exercise, the regularity, the frequent follow-ups. I mean, it has to be like a separate protocol. Uh, then only we will see uh, good efficacy. Uh, there is somebody who's asked something. Uh, what about static plus dynamic obstruction? Uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Joshi, that's what Dr. Susanna said, that uh, is surgery better for static and then MFT also to be added. So we do need to uh, very often, in fact, like for any other uh, thing in medicine, that we need to yeah. combine the two modes of treatment. Yeah, I, I no. used to say questions that the, you, you are not treating the cause, you <clears> have to <throat> Disease. If I'm doing that, it's like making a cake. You 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 cannot make a cake by adding one ingredient at a time. You have to add all the ingredients to have a beautiful cake and a tasty one. So uh, it's like the kind of example that I gave to patients so they can understand what we are doing. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful analogy. <laughs> I shall <laughs> future in a sweet <laughs> one. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's a good one. Uh, easy to comprehend that you know if yeah. you miss out some ingredients, you're not going to get something. Yeah, yeah, of course. By the end of it. Uh, so I want to thank you again. I think for your time. Uh, there was somebody was trying yes, to something. Sure. Oh, okay, ruin it. Say it, uh, please. Ma'am, can you please allow screen sharing? Uh, uh, Doctor Man Manveer. Snigda. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Just allow him to share. So uh, for all the people while he's sharing, um, or the ones, who, so Dr. Susanna uh, Falado Ramos has uh, very kindly agreed to also do some master class on this, which will have more uh, video demonstrations of the exercises, and it will be like a live thing. Uh, so we will send you a few uh, questions, and the people oh. who think they're going to benefit. You do let us know. Then we'll plan that accordingly in the next few months. 
Yeah. So this is a class three, skeletal class three cases. Yes, ma'am. So this what we can what we can see in this case is that the patient has a beautiful pharyngeal airspace. Uh, but from uh, this, uh, you know, the, the soft palate is almost like uh, is this is the soft palate. Yeah. And it seems that the tongue is, you know, is yeah. almost touching the soft palate and probably it will be a class for Malampati score. Yeah. So uh, what do you think about such cases like? Uh... This is this is a surgical case. You, you know, you have a great upper airway. Uh, and it, it looks like to have a great volume as well, but volume of the upper airway is not all. Uh, you have to have in mind the endotypes and the phenotypes of OZA. You, you mm. have here a great anatomy of, of the upper airway, but you, if you have a poor uh, a muscle response or if you have a loop gain or, or a, a different arousal threshold, you will have a problem. So you never know. Uh, and for this case, do you, do, do you know the index, the apnea, hypopnea index of this patient? No, no, uh, this patient uh, does not, like I have not uh, got this patient uh, sleep study. And okay. The patient did not present with a sleep problem as such. But okay. uh, I was just looking at this cephalogram and I was just wondering that uh, since the pa the, so the tongue is like almost you know adapted yeah. to the soft palate yeah. and the hard palate but the posterior airway is very good so i just thought maybe i should share this case you have here you have here very uh, a few problems in in my opinion if you work too much the praxis the lingual praxis mm -hmm. you are going to have problems with the anterior uh, position of the incisors, they are in, they are in uh, a crossbite, mm -hmm. and maybe you will have more problems there. So you have to study very well this case. I will ask a PhD for this patient because oh. for sure that I don't know if it is a she or a he. It's a he. Uh, he has for sure. He has apnea or hypopnea, or he can has also rarus or resistant of the upper airway. So you have to study first the, the, the and do first the sleep exam and do the cephalometric analysis. And this is not a uh, easy case. You have to have uh, very careful with this case. This patient has a large tongue. It's scalloped and very, it's almost like a macroglossia. It's, He's a 24 year old male and he's not overweight, but still the tongue is large and uh, uh, there is macroglossia. So, yeah, you have, I, I don't know, maybe hip, uh, hippo, hippo development of the upper maxillary. Maybe you, you have to study very well this case. But for me, first the, the, the sleep exam. And you have to study this in a multidisciplinary team because I think you will need it maybe a um, maxillary surgeon and orthodontics as well and a speech and a speech therapist as well to help them. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank, thanks a lot for your input. Oh, it's okay. Thank you so much for sharing. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank um, you, ma'am. Okay, I think then we will uh, close with this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Susanna Falado, again for being with us and uh, Thank you so all much. your valuable time and your thoughts. I do appreciate your efforts to My pleasure. introduce this to us. And thank you again uh, for all the participants who've been here and you know, shared your uh, thoughts and experiences and looking forward to yeah. seeing you all again. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. And thank you so much to all the colleagues that uh, subscribed the lecture and were here today discussing. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Mamvir. Thank you. Thank you.